Picking out your first camera for filmmaking can be pretty overwhelming with all the different choices out there. So to make that decision a little easier, I've been testing out some of the latest cameras to help figure out which one is the best for your videos. Hey everyone, Cam here helping you to make good videos. And when it comes to video, it's important to realize that the camera is just a tool. So going out and getting some expensive cinema camera isn't going to automatically make your videos good. It's learning how to use that camera well to tell a story that's going to make your video stand out. And these entry level cameras can do some pretty amazing things now. But before we get to those camera recommendations, there are three things you need to keep in mind, which are the sensor size, the resolution, and the frame rate. And I've made in-depth videos on all these topics, which I'll have linked in the description description, but for a quick overview, your sensor size is going to determine how well your camera does in lower lighting conditions and also what field of view your lens sees. Your resolution is going to determine whether your footage is HD at 720, Full HD at 1080, or 4K, which is four times Full HD. And then there's frame rate, which is normally 24 frames per second in video, and with 60 frames per second or higher, you have the ability to change the speed of your footage to use it for slow motion. Also, each of these cameras has an external microphone input, which is important because you don't want to rely on the built-in camera mics, which aren't very good. And I'm going to be comparing similar models between Canon and Sony, and I know some of you are going to ask, what about Panasonic? Yes, I know they make good cameras overall, but I'm just not really a fan of the Micro Four Thirds system. And I have links in the description for the best prices I could find on Amazon and B&H for all of these cameras, which won't cost you anything extra, but it will greatly help out the channel if you decide to buy through them. First up, we have the Canon R10 for $979 and the Sony ZV-E10 for $698. And before you go writing in the comments, those are way too expensive to be beginner cameras. Keep in mind that filmmaking is not a cheap hobby to get into, and I'd be willing to bet that a lot of you are probably going to write those comments on something like an iPhone that costs the same or even more than these cameras. But the good thing is, your iPhone has apps available that give you even more control over the video settings, so you can actually get really good video out of your iPhone and use that while you save up to get one of these types of cameras that will give you even more video options and better quality. So rather than going out and just getting the cheapest camera you can find, like perhaps the Canon M50 as opposed to the R10 that I'm suggesting, which I'll address later why I wouldn't suggest that camera for video, it's better to invest more now in a camera that's gonna last you for a long time, as opposed to realizing that that cheaper camera doesn't meet all of your needs and then you end up buying the more expensive camera anyway. So with that, both cameras have an APS-C size sensor which crops the lens focal length by 1.6 on the R10 and 1.5 on the ZV-E10. Both cameras have an articulating touchscreen giving you ability to use touch autofocus and see yourself when recording which is great for vlogging or videos like this. The ZV-E10 doesn't have an electronic viewfinder so you'll have to use the articulating touchscreen for photos as well, whereas the R10 has an electronic viewfinder giving you the options to use that for photo or video. I typically use the rear screen when taking photos anyway, so it's not really an issue for me, but if an EVF is something you like, then be sure to take that into account. Both cameras can shoot 4K at 24 and 30 frames per second, as well as Full HD up to 120 frames per second, which allows you to get really smooth slow motion footage. One of the reasons the R10 is so much more is because its footage has the option of 422 10-bit video, whereas the ZV-E10 is only 420 8-bit. I know that sounds a bit technical and maybe a little confusing, but I also have other videos explaining how bit depth and color sampling will affect your video quality and if it really makes that much of a difference and is worth the extra cost for most people shooting video. The R10 also gives you the option of 4K at 60 frames per second. However, there will be an extra crop of 1.8 on your lens, making it look really zoomed in and hard to get wide angle shots. Neither camera has the typical 30 minute video recording limit, so you can record up to the point where you run out of space on your SD card or your battery dies. And the R10 is quite a bit larger than the ZV-E10 and more comfortable to hold, but the ZV-E10 is also much less expensive and has more video features such as picture profiles that allow you even more control over the video quality and options for post-production as you learn more about improving your videos. There are also many more native lens options for the ZV-E10 as compared to the R10 with its relatively new R mount that has a limited and very expensive range of lenses. And speaking of lenses, I have lens suggestion videos for both of these cameras that will help you get the most out of either of these cameras when it comes to the video features that you'll want to have. Both of these are great beginner cameras under $1,000, but if you do have a larger budget to spend on a camera that will really last you a long time, then the Canon EOS R or the Sony a7C for $1,800 are both great choices. Both of these cameras have full frame sensors which will give you much better performance in low light and a shallower depth of field. Both cameras also have 
have an articulating touchscreen that gives you the ability to use that same touch autofocus and tracking. The a7C has a tiny viewfinder that's pretty much useless for photos, so you'll need to stick with the rear monitor again for that. But when it comes to the EOS R, it has a crop of 1.8 when shooting 4K, which will almost double the focal length of your lens whereas the a7C uses a 6K to 4K downsampling to get a full readout of the sensor for 4K. The EOS R maxes out at 60 frames per second, but the a7C will give you up to 120 frames per second in full HD for an even smoother slow motion compared to the 60 frames per second of the EOS R. The EOS R has the standard 30 minute video recording limit, however the a7C has unlimited video recording, and something I really need to stress is do not buy the Canon M50 or M50 Mark II for video. They have very limited video features with a huge crop in 4K that makes the autofocus pretty much useless. If you only use Full HD, then you'll get good, reliable autofocus performance, but why buy a 4K camera if you can't use the 4K reliably? And the Canon T8i is a little better than the M50 in that it has more lens options, but it still suffers from the same crop and autofocus issues when shooting 4K. And after spending time with these cameras, I do prefer the Sony models because of the extra video features that they offer offer. But once again, remember that the camera is just a tool in the filmmaking process, and it's your skills and learning how to use that tool to tell a good story that's going to set your films apart. And I have a lot of other videos linked in the description to help you with learning how to use your new camera to tell a better story. So regardless of which camera you choose, just be sure to practice with it every day so you can learn how to shape those shots and make them flow to tell a better story. But if this video was helpful, then please help me out by leaving a like, hit that subscribe button for future videos. We're getting close to 40,000 subscribers subscribers and I think we're going to be doing a camera giveaway pretty soon so keep a lookout for that and I'll see you in the next one.